I'm going to read God's word to us so we can uh, listen to him together. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 10 to 17. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hello everyone, great to have you with us and lovely to be joined by Roseanne. One of the joys of the last few months has been to be joined by overseas partners quite regularly reading and praying. I hope you've got a Bible open, Andy encourages us to do that. Important that you see what I'm saying and check, is what I'm saying what the Bible's saying? And let me read again the beginning of verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of. But as for you, this passage, in fact the whole letter, is an encouragement to go against the tide. It's as if everyone is going that way, and Paul pleads with Timothy, and pleads with us, but as for you, keep going the right way. And there's something quite inspiring about that, a bit dull just to go with the crowd, isn't it? And yet at the same time, if we're honest, something rather daunting, very daunting. Because we human beings are herd animals. We like to be with the crowd. We don't like going against the flow. And we're going to need the help of God to understand God's challenge to us and the help of the Holy Spirit to accept the challenge and to live it out. So let me pray as we begin. But as for you, Loving Father, by your Holy Spirit, may we understand what you're saying to us through this passage. And may we desire, determine to do it so that our lives bring honor to you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. You may know that the Grenfell Inquiry is going on. Remember the, the, the horror of the fire at the Grenfell Tower and just this week, a young man who was a member of the company, employed by the company rather, who put the material that was meant to insulate the, the tower and was designed to be non-combustible, turned up before the inquiry. And he made an honest admission. He said that effectively, the trials on that material had been rigged. A barrister asked him, didn't that strike you as a bit dishonest? And very honestly, he said, well, I was uneasy. But then he said this. I was 22. It was my first job. This was standard company practice and all the products that were tested. My boss told me to do it. Everyone else did it. So I just went along with it. Well, what would I have done? I like to think that I would have said, no, I can't do that. I like to think that but I can't be sure. That man would possibly have lost his job, very likely would have lost friends. It's very hard to go against the flow. We're looking at to Timothy, and some commentators of this letter have described Timothy as timid Timothy. They get the impression that here was a weak, rather pathetic individual 
lacking in character, and that's why Paul had to write to him in the first chapter, reminding him that he didn't have a spirit of timidity or cowardice, but a spirit of power. Timid Timothy. And the impression you get is that Paul is having to say, come on, man up, don't be a wimp, Timothy. I think that kind of comment about this letter is really lacking in understanding of the situation that Timothy faced. I don't think Timothy was particularly wet or timid. I think he was just normal. Do you remember the situation? Paul in jail, on death row. Close members of the band that had been with Timothy and Paul preaching the gospel around the known world had distanced themselves from Paul and from his gospel. They were worried they were the next to be in jail. And now within the church that Timothy was leading the church in Ephesus, there were new teachers. And they'd cancelled out those aspects of the Bible's teaching that didn't fit with the world around, so that people loved them. And thus they got rid of any conflict. They went with the flow and not against it. Well, given that circumstance, don't you think that anyone would have found huge pressure and huge temptation just to go with the flow? it's very unlikely I will ever end up in jail for preaching the gospel. It feels more likely now than it did a decade or so, but it's very, very unlikely. And I'm working for a church where there are, there are not different factions with different messages. It's a wonderful unity here at St. Debs. Yet I'll be honest, there are times when the pressure of standing against the way in which the world is going gets to me. Just this week I said to a colleague, you know, the North Pole seems very attractive to me at the moment because of one particular difficult circumstance I was in that I had to stand against the tide, and I didn't like doing it. There are plenty of times when I look at a bit of the Bible and I think, oh, I want to preach that positive. Oh, I wish I could edit out that negative, the kind of negatives that the world around us hates, and some in the church hate. Am I a wimp? Well, possibly. But I reckon I'm just normal. I think Timothy was just normal. And I'd be very surprised if you're not normal too. And therefore, if you don't feel the pressure just to go with the flow. Maybe you're not a Christian, and you're looking into the Christian faith, and you've begun to be compelled by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But maybe you're holding back, and one thing that's holding you back is this sense that if you put Christ first, you'll be going that way, and everyone around you will seem to be going the other way, and that's challenging. And those of you who are Christians, you know the pressure. You know the temptation just to compromise, just to keep quiet, just to go with everyone else. It's easier that way. And so Paul's challenge comes to Timothy, yes, and to us. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of. Stick with the gospel. It's the appeal we've seen throughout this letter. I've given the title, Keep the Faith, to these studies. And all the different appeals in the letter are essentially saying the same thing. Stick with it. And they're undergirded by reasons. Stick with it because of what you know, Timothy. You know those who taught the gospel to you. They're for real. And you know the scriptures that they taught you. They're from God. Those are the headings that I've nicked from a friend of mine. I think they get right to the heart of what this passage is saying. So that's where we're heading. Stick with the gospel, even when that means going against the flow. Why? Well, first, because you know who taught the gospel to you. They're for real. It's there in verse 14. Continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. You know them, Timothy. Possibly he's talking about his mother and grandmother who raised him in the faith, Jewish faith first of all, and then they became Christians. Certainly talking about Paul. The section begins, verse 10, you, however, interestingly, exactly the same words as are there in verse 14, translated there, but as for you. One of three occasions 
in just a few verses where those two little words in Greek, sude, come, but as for you, it's there in verse 10, it's there in verse 14. We'll see it again next week in chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, but as for you, Timothy, verse 10, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. He's deliberately contrasting himself with those other teachers that have been the focus of verse 14 of chapter 2 to the end of the section we looked at last week. Do you remember them? These teachers that loved themselves more than they loved God. And the result was that they gave people what they wanted to hear because that made life easier for themselves. And so they were frauds, effectively. They were not for real, as Paul puts it in verse 13. They're imposters. And Paul says you can know they're not the real thing because, verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It just goes with the territory. Jesus said as much in his teaching. He said, if you stick with me, then just as the world rejects me, sooner or later you'll find the world will reject you. Not that we're looking for it. There are times when Christians bring it on by frankly crass behavior. We're not looking for trouble. In fact, we want to have as good relations as we can with those around us. And we can have many good friends who are not Christian. But the time will inevitably come when we'll find huge pressure and disapproval. And people give us a hard time because we don't do what they do. We don't say what they say. And just as Jesus was rejected, there'll be times when we will too. And by the way, it's, it's worth asking, if that's never happened to me in any way, I can't identify with those words. Everyone who lives a godly life will be persecuted. Makes me wonder, am I a Christian? And if I am, then am I so worried about what people might think and so scared of the world that I just withdraw and spend all my time with other Christians, in which case I'll never have a hard time, but I'm not where God wants me to be, engaging in the world. Or is it that I've just assimilated? I'm just echoing what people want to hear. I'm no different in the way I live. It's a real challenge. These other teachers, stop teaching those things which challenge people. And they gave a message that echoed what the world was saying. They just toned down or cut out altogether those aspects of the Christian faith that the world didn't like. In today's terms, it would mean, no doubt, saying virtually nothing about sin, nothing about judgment, nothing about Jesus being the only way to God, toning down the cost and the need to repent of sins. And Paul says, no, I, I wasn't like that. They weren't for real. They're imposters. They were frauds. They're not the real thing. But you know me, verse 10. You know about my teaching, my way of life. Notice both. There's a match between them. A match between his teaching and his way of life. He's the real deal. We're familiar, I guess, with the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and maybe also the evil Trinity, sometimes so-called, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the great enemies of the Christian. Here we have what's been called the Christian Trinity, faith and love and hope, those qualities that should mark every Christian. And as we look at Paul's list of characteristics, we won't look at them in turn, we see those characteristics of faith and love and hope. Timothy, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith. He really believed through thick and thin. My love, it's another word that Paul uses. He loved Timothy. It's a very warm letter. It begins to Timothy, my Dear son, he loved people, even those who opposed him. He loved them. He urged Timothy, do you remember, to gently instruct those who said different things and were false teachers. 
still to love them. A man of faith and love and hope. He refers to his patience, his endurance, qualities linked in Paul's letters with hope. He speaks about endurance inspired by hope. Paul had a deep conviction of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. There's a glory to come on what he calls that day when Jesus returns. And spurred on by that great conviction about the future, he was prepared to suffer in the present. So in encouraging Timothy to suffer for the gospel, as he does throughout the letter, he's not like some first world war general from behind the front line, puffing away in a cigar, sipping a port, and sending people over the lines. No, Paul was suffering. And he said, join with me. He's the real deal. You know, Timothy, how I suffered in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. He certainly knew about Lystra. Lystra was Timothy's hometown. When he was there, Paul was stoned. He was so battered that they assumed he was dead and he was dragged out of town, and only then did he revive. And Timothy, no doubt, saw that. Paul had no fair weather faith. Paul didn't just adapt his way of life or his teaching to fit his own self-love. He really believed. He was the real thing, marked by faith and love and hope. And when I'm tempted to compromise, it helps me to remember those who are the real thing. We've got a nose for hypocrisy, haven't we? And sadly, there, there are times when all of us don't live out our faith. But I'm inspired, yes, by the example of the Apostle Paul. I'm inspired by Roseanne. I've known Roseanne for over 30 years. First met her when she was studying here, here in Oxford, studying Japanese. And she became a Christian. And she thought, those people in Japan, they need the gospel. And so she spent the last 25 years, much of it, in Japan. It's tough out there. A long way from friends and family in a very different culture. Why is she there? Because she's for real. She believes the gospel. She's prepared to put herself on the line for it and to suffer for it. I think of friends converted with me, a little revival at school. And I was an older boy, so I was able to cope with it. But once a number of people were converted, there was a strong backlash in the school, a lot of opposition. And the younger ones really suffered because of it. But what an encouragement it was to see them persevering in the faith. And 30 years later, well, actually, more like 40 years nearly, they're still persevering in the faith. Maybe you can think of friends, maybe those who first brought the gospel to you, who are for real, and that should inspire and spur you on to live out the gospel. So you've got a choice. And Paul says, do you want to go with those imposters? They're not for real. They adapt the message. They adapt their lifestyle to fit in with what they want and what the world wants. No, stick with me and with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep going. Stick with the gospel. Because those who brought the gospel to you, they're for real. And because the scriptures they brought, they're from God. Look at verse 15. And how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed. Scripture at the time was the, the Old Testament Scriptures. Much of the New Testament hadn't been written. And yet, in only a matter of time, Peter, in his second letter found in the New Testament, describes Paul's writings as Scripture from the earliest days the apostolic teachings were regarded as God's word. And Paul is saying about the Old Testament, it's true of Old and New Testament. These scriptures are from God. Remarkable teaching about the Bible here. For a start, it's Christ-centered. Did you notice that in verse 15? Very remarkable when you realize he's talking about the Old Testament. It can make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's you're new to the Bible. And here's the key to it. 
It's all about Christ. It's true, obviously, of the New Testament. It's true of the Old as well. There's one great story that goes all the way through the Bible about a God of amazing love who made the world, about human beings turning away from God, pushing them out of their lives, and the world getting all messed up, but about a God who promises to put things right. And that promise is added to and clarified as you go through the Old Testament. It's a promise that's pointing to its fulfillment in Christ. We might say, Old Testament, Christ promised. New Testament, Christ proclaimed. That's what the Bible's about, to make you wise for salvation. It's not a rule book. It's a rescue book telling us about the way to be right with God, not because of what we do, we'll never deserve it, but through faith, trust in what Jesus has done. That's the core of it. If one mistake under pressure is to just edit out of the Bible those bits that the world doesn't like, Another mistake is to go to the other extreme and to be de- so determined to say things that don't want, people don't want to hear that we spend all our time majoring on those things that people don't want to hear. And our message gets out of joint. And we major on minors. Now, above all, what we want to say is, yes, the whole counsel of God, but at the heart of it all, the great good news of Christ and the salvation that's offered to all through him. It's a very positive message we've got to say to the world. Do you remember the Holy Scriptures? That are Christ-centered. Next truth, they're God-breathed. A curious phrase, verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed. Just as my words come to you on my breath, you wouldn't hear them otherwise. So Scripture... The Bible comes to us on the breath of God. The word for breath is exactly the same word in the New Testament Greek as the word for spirit, Holy Spirit. And so we might say all Scripture is God-spirited. The Bible comes to us on the breath or by the Spirit of God. And that's why we take it so very seriously. It's not just a human book. There are those who say, well, it's fine to read the Bible out of historic interest to see what people thought back then, but it's no longer relevant today. It's rather like an old map. I've got an old map of Oxford from about 100 years ago on my wall at home, and it's it's fascinating to look, and you can locate St. Ebbs. We've always been here. But the streets around St. Ebbs are completely different. Fascinating to tell you what Oxford was like 100 years ago, completely useless if I wanted to show a friend how to get to the Westgate Center. Because, of course, the Westgate Center isn't on my old map. And people say the Bible's like that. Historical interest only can't help you for today. But no. Yes, it's true, the Bible's a human book written by different human beings at different times in history a long time ago. But it's also divine. God the Holy Spirit ensured that what they wrote was exactly what he wanted them to write. And so the Bible is the word of God. It still speaks today. It's Christ-centered, God-breathed, and all-sufficient. Down again at verse 16. All scriptures God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Servant of God, it's an expression used in the Old Testament to speak of people like Moses and and David. It's it's God's servants, you might say the equivalent today, are those who are set apart to lead the churches. That's why it's used for Timothy. And remember, Timothy's reminded that those who are church leaders are workmen. And he, Paul says to Timothy, you remember chapter 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. It's a very humble way of talking about a Bible teacher, just a worker. And we're workers with one tool. The Bible, we're told, will enable the servant of God to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the only tool I need for my trade which is why just under 30 years ago when I was ordained down the road at Christchurch Cathedral, the Bishop of Oxford, as he ordained me, gave me one thing, this book. 
He said, receive this book. It's the only tool I need. As I teach belief, what we're meant to believe about God. Don't take it from me, take it from this book. Who God is, how to get to know him through Christ. It's all there in these matters of belief. I love the words of John Wesley. He said once, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. God himself has condescended to teach the way. He's written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. We need this book. And to stick with it, not move on to something else. It tells us how to get right with God. It's what we need in matters of belief. It's what we need in matters of behavior. How can we possibly please God if we don't know what he thinks, what he wants? We're looking forward to the time when finally we can all come back in this building. And the end of church, perhaps, you'd notice I've been preaching away, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, and you, you rush up, and you give me a cup of coffee. And I might say thank you, but the first thing I, I'd notice is that it's got milk in it, and actually I'm lactose intolerant, I can't have it. And more than that, I actually can only cope with one coffee a day, and I have it in the morning, so I can't drink it at this time of the day. You've tried to please me, but you haven't. If you want to please me, I need to speak and say, Actually, what I'd really like is just a glass of water. And then you need to listen. And then you put it into practice. It's the same. We need God to speak. And wonderfully, he has. And so the task of Glenn, me, those of us who've got the responsibility as leaders of St. Debs is to teach this, bu this book. Teach, rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness. Talking about the positive and the negative. Positively saying, this is what the Bible's saying. Negatively, no, that's not right. Positively saying, this is the way we live. Negatively saying, no, that's not the way to live. Not with our own authority, but with the authority of the Bible. It's all we need. But as for you, but as for you, timid, Timothy, well, yes, he was. Timid Vaughan? Yes, I am. I don't like going against the flow any more than Timothy did, any more, I guess, than you do. It's going to be costly. And for all I know, it's very costly for you right now. If it's not now, it will be at some stage before too long. And day by day, we need to make decisions to go against the flow. Everyone, even in the church sometimes, seem to be saying one thing. But as for you, stick with the gospel. Because you know who taught it to you? They're for real. And you know what they taught? The scriptures. They're from God. Let's pray. Loving Father, forgive us. Forgive us for times when we've just gone with the flow and we haven't resisted. We've not been faithful to you. We thank you for forgiveness in Christ. We thank you for those who taught the gospel to us, for their integrity. We thank you for the, the Bible that they gave to us, that it's true, it's from you. Please help us to stick with this wonderful message, whatever the cost, for Jesus' sake. Amen.